My name is Michael Kovach. I'm 44 years old. Uh, I was born and raised right across the line here in the Shenango Valley. Uh, and I'm a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm. I'm not from farm people, but uh, I always had this feeling that I needed to be on a farm, and that's where I'd ultimately end up. Uh, so about the last six years or so, I spent uh, most of my time um, trying to exactly see what everybody was talking about when they said, uh, you don't want to be any part of that. They were right uh, a lot of times. When we first started out, I didn't know exactly what we were going to raise or how we were going to raise it. Um, I'd read a lot of books while I was still dreaming about farming by the likes of Michael Pollan and Joel Sallett and the Lunatic Farmer. And I decided, uh, based on that, that we would be a sustainable farm, grass-based and not organic, but uh, sustainable in, in the non-use of chemicals and pesticides, and that's what we wanted to do, and that's what we've done. We've added non-GMO to that list, and uh, we're working on adding non-GMO to that list. Farming is and uh, always has been a very difficult uh, way of life, a uh, lifestyle, I like to call it. It's, it's more than a job or a vocation. It's a lifestyle. There's no off time. There's no um, being off of work. Uh, the challenges that come along with it every day have driven innovation now for millennia. Um, it might be something as small as figuring out a better way to hold open a gate or close a gate, or as big as designing a new tractor. Uh, it's driven innovation for millennia now. Um, for instance, uh, these days with modern machinery and um, equipment, we can make more hay in a single pass than an entire family used to be able to make in a life in a sole season. Uh, innovation uh, has also driven efficiency on the farm and in food production. In 1950, 12% uh, of the United States population was engaged in farming. Uh, according to the FDA or the, uh, it'll be the Farm Bureau, um, that number is only at 2% now. But at the same time, we're producing 262% more food. That's pretty amazing. That speaks very well of the constant innovation that we're talking about. But the other side of that coin is that fewer of us Americans have friends or family or acquaintances that live or work on a farm nowadays. And I believe that that's a big contributor to the giant disconnect we've got with our food now. Uh, we don't ever think about beef looking like that pastoral thing walking around in the thing other than on the label because... They look like that package of meat in the store. That's what we're used to seeing beef look like. And maybe that's because we don't have that uncle that's farming 50 acres outside of town anymore. Uh, we don't think about turkeys looking like the white little things running around in the field so much because we don't go out and help our cousin clean out his coops after Thanksgiving anymore. You know, it's less common. Uh, rather, we think about it looking like uh, the turkey bacon slide. <laughs> uh, because that's what it looks like in that glossy coupon on Sundays. You know, I mean, we're, we're used to seeing food in this glossy flyer on a Sunday paper. It's, the reality is it's more to it than that. Despite the bucolic scenes on a lot of packaging, mass-produced beef are often packed in squalid conditions called CAFOs, confined area feed operations. and They're just packed in there like uh, sardines and force-fed the grains that they're never evolved to eat. Ruminants are, are evolved to eat grass. They got four stomachs for the reason to eat grass. But we found out that if we feed them corn, they put on weight faster. It's the taste that we're used to these days. Uh, the industrialization of our uh, food system has, has allowed Americans to enjoy more food and cheaper than at any time or any place in history. That's pretty impressive. I mean, we can feed a lot of people with a lot fewer farmers. That's great. However, like all efficiency gains uh, or things that seem too good to be true, uh, many of the advances that add up to these efficiencies come with a hidden cost. Uh, not the kind of cost that the food factories are going to lose money off their bottom line, God forbid. Uh, costs that are thrust back onto us as a society uh, in the form of environmental pollution and all that sort of thing, but some of the more important things are that our food is less nutritious than it used to be. 
And a large part of that reason for that is that we've overworked the soils that the, the food's grown in. Um, we add nitrogen so that we can get a good corn crop and better bushels per acre, but we're losing all these micronutrients that are very important as well to the nutrition. That's gone. Uh, genetically engineered crops? I'm sure everybody's heard of GMOs at this point. Is there anybody that hasn't? GMOs are, are pitched by the, by the biotech companies as being these hybrids. It's something that's been around forever, hybrids. They're not hybrids. Hybrids are the result of selective breeding to create a better plant or animal or whatever. Not so with GMOs. GMOs are chunks of little DNA taken from a dissimilar organism and shot in with a gun or some other sci-fi-esque technique that I don't really understand completely into the organism that they want to trade in. For instance, BT corn or soy is a result of chopping a little piece of DNA that codes for a protein that's a pesticide to rootworms, which is a bane of all farmers everywhere forever, so that the plant creates its own pesticide. Great idea on paper. Sounds really good. Unfortunately, um, there's a, a give back for that as well. It's not all bad news. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're getting these herbicide-resistant plants, even though we've got this great technology that we can create our own pesticide within the plant. <coughs> Those rootworms are developing a tolerance to that toxin, the toxin that's been effective for eons in protecting those bacteria is now becoming ineffective because we're using it in a concentrated fashion and, and not managing it properly. We're not rotating our crops properly because our food's been commoditized. So corn's real high this year. We're going to plant corn again this year even though we ought to have beans in that ground. That's part of it. This all sounds really bad. And it is. There's no, there's no two ways about it. There's just no two ways about it. We've gone down a bad path with our food. However, in about the last 10 years or so, we've had something of a re renaissance where food awareness is concerned. And it's owing greatly to people like Joel Salatin and Michael Pollan and the movies like Food Inc. and Food Matters. If you haven't seen those, I encourage you strongly to look at them. It'll change the way you think even in the course of an hour and a half documentary. It's a great niche market, these documentaries, but that there is a market for it is evidence of this new renaissance, this new awareness of our food. Otherwise, they couldn't sell the books or the documentaries. Further evidence is that farmers' markets are more popular now than they ever were. People are buying local and sustainable and ethically raised and grass-fed and all the buzzwords. We've even got a bunch, there was a slide with a bunch of buzzwords that we've <laughs> just, locavore, you know, that's something that never was in the vernacular before 10 years ago, and now it's in every article about food everywhere. We're still a long way to eating, from <coughs> eating as well as we could. Uh, there's a lot of innovation to be redirected toward more sustainable paradigms. There's a lot of misinformation about what, how, or how our food should be raised is still out there as law and rule. It's what people have come to accept. We're getting there, though. Uh, we're just only really starting to realize how much our food it actually affects our health and well-being. Even though a fellow a few years ago said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food, it's really becoming popularly accepted that you are what you eat. It's, it's more than just a saying. So in the words of our hero, Joel Salatin, uh, we as food buyers have the distinct privilege of proactively participating in shaping the world our children will inherit. And that's the innovation that I really wanted to get at today. Innovating our attitudes about our food and the way it's grown. We can do this. We're good <coughs> at it. We'll figure out a way to raise things more sustainably and feed the world without GMOs and recombinant this and that and ray guns that take genes from one thing and put them into another. But it takes us all doing it. It's not some agency can't dictate that this is the way it's got to be. We have to be the <coughs> ones to encourage farmers by voting with our forks every single day. Michael Pollan said it a long time ago. You get to vote three times ago with a, with a fork, three times a day. So purchasing sustainably raised and 
and ethically raised, and, you know, I mean, pick your poison. Basically, just pick one little thing that you want to champion about our food system, making our food system better, and patronize that. Whether it's a local farm up the road, a farmer's market down in town at night, b and that's a cool one. <laughs> or, you know, somebody that's animal welfare approved or something like that, if that's, if that's what you want to do. But take that first step. Innovate the way that you think about your food and vote with your forks. Thanks very much for your time and sorry about the slides.